Good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday, February 15th. Welcome into the Morning Medical Update. Thank you so much for joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. We are so honored today to welcome in Dr. Doug Gerard. He is the chancellor over at KU. Today, we're going to talk about what KU has learned during this pandemic and how vaccines are now influencing decisions on the KU campus, plus the changes that are now being made at sporting events and among trainers. Dr. Steve Stites, of course, is also with us today, just for a little bit, we think. So make sure you get your questions sent into us now on YouTube, Facebook, and on the Medical News Network. You can find those links right there on your screen. But now let's turn to Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control, Dr. Dana Hawkinson. Uh, you've got our COVID count Hi. this morning. Good yeah. morning to you. Hi, good morning. Uh, numbers are holding steady as far as active infections, although down from two weeks ago and three weeks ago. 57 active infections currently with 11 in the ICU, six on the ventilator, 80 in that recovery period, so a total of 137 as well. All right, Doc Hawk, thanks so much. Yeah. We'll be back with you here in just a few moments. Do we have any reporter questions on the line today? I'm getting a hard no. All right, so we'll get to our community here in just a few moments. But the latest numbers from the University of Kansas campus in Lawrence show that KU has a nearly 18% positivity rate. That number reflects the latest data out of uh, that came out on February 4th. Of those latest tests, 402 people were tested for COVID and 73 of those tests came back positive. 57 students are now in isolation as a uh, result of a possible COVID exposure. So again, we want to uh, welcome in our great guest today, KU Chancellor and Dr. Doug Gerard. How are you today? Good morning. Good Thanks to see you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. This is almost like a play date for you and Dr. Stein. Yeah, this is, is the best. Is. Right? You know, okay. I, I so it's the only enough. time we get to see each other. I know. Much, so. You guys are really sad. Thing. You I should come over more often. <laughs> so I'm going to let you two catch up here in just a few moments. I have a few questions I want to ask Dr. Gerard, uh, and then um, I'm I'm going to let you talk to your buddy a little okay. bit. Okay, so let's just jump in and talk about how KU has been weathering this latest surge. Sure. Let's update it. Sure. You know, uh, just like the rest of the community, we, we came back uh, to start spring semester sort of in the midst of this Omicron surge that, that uh, really hit all our communities and kind of came in a wave across mm -hmm. the country. Um, and, and we kind of saw that wave coming, started out Good. east and worked its way west. Um, and so as, as we looked at welcoming our students back to campus, um, recognizing that we had fairly high vaccination rate uh, within our campus community, um, we, we did a little more focus testing this go around and, and really focused very much more on the symptomatic side of things. And, and, um, and for a little bit had some challenging times getting enough tests. I mean, we all, I think, went through that a little bit as well, but well, we got through that pretty quickly. You know, we had at the end of last semester, we, we uh, were under an executive order as a federal contractor, and therefore we were put in an awkward situation to have a state law that says we can't ask if you're vaccinated or not, and a federal contractor executive order saying you have to ask. And so <laughs> for about a three-week period while the, the court sorted that out, um, we were asking and going into that process. And while we didn't get all the way through the process, we got as far as to know that over 83% of our community was vaccinated. Um, and that was faculty, students, and staff. And so uh, we actually think it's probably much higher than that because we had to stop asking at that point. But but uh, that gave us some confidence coming into all of this, knowing that, that uh, those that are vaccinated, while still can get ill, are probably not going to get seriously ill. And that gave us some confidence coming into this. So heading into the third year of this pandemic, what have you learned over these past couple of years as we wait for what the pandemic has in store for us next? Well, it's certainly we've learned that we can operate safely. You know, I mm -hmm. think if, if, if nothing else, that's, that's probably the one takeaway from all of this, the standard infection measures, uh, masking indoors, um, it, do, it does work. And, and, it, and uh, doing so, really, we can keep each other safe and keep operating, and that was really critical. And that's kind of been how we operate now without a whole lot of afterthought um, at, at this point, continuing masking indoors. Athletics events have been a bit more of a challenge, uh, particularly as we went out of the fall outside into the into the winter inside. Um, and, and we've seen that across the country, but I've been really proud of how people have stepped up for that. So what's the, what has the tone been overall, or how has it changed, I guess, over the last couple of years with masking on college campuses, that age group? What's the feel? What do you hear? You know, to be honest, I, well, certainly everybody's getting tired of the pandemic. You know, they, they've, uh, I would say our community has been great about accepting the fact that we can keep each other safe. Nobody wants to go home 
first and foremost. Nobody wants to go home. And so uh, people are willing to do what they need to do to make sure that we can continue to, to meet in person, face to face, in our classrooms, in our laboratories, in our lecture halls, um, in our performances. And, you know, it's so uh, we have very diverse environments, but we've proven now, three years in, that, that we can do this and we can do it safely. And so I've been really proud of the entire community and how they've stepped up to make sure we don't have to find ourselves in a situation where we need to shut it down again. Good leadership over there, I see. So well, that's good. great that team. Helps. Great team. <laughs> that helps. Right? But, you know, just to be able to say a couple things. Well, first of all, um, it's not where we started, right? Things were tough those first yeah. few times we did. I remember working with some of the different the fraternities and sororities and having to have people drive through and talk to them when they were all had the big group gatherings at the first part of the wave. And I think what, what has KU has done great, and I'm, you know, Doug and I are good friends, but just, we're going to be really objective here and just be honest. The, uh, the fact they have done great, and, and here's why. They, they, did, they, they took the rules of infection control to heart, and they followed them. And so they kept kids safe. They kept their staff safe. safe. They kept the, 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 the folks who work at the university safe. And because of that, the university should, it gets, they get an A-plus for how they've done here on their final term paper. And, and to be honest with you, if you step back, they've had a great relationship with the county. And that has helped immensely. They had a great relationship with the city. And so with the county and the city and the university working together, they put together a plan that kept the community safe. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a remarkable statement because not everybody's done that. But if you look at how Douglas County has fared at the worst sides of this pandemic, it's been better than what they probably would have done had they not been working so closely together and they've kept the entire community safe. And I think that is a remarkable statement and not a lot of places have been able to say well, that. Well, so. I, I couldn't agree more and our partnership with the city and the county has never been better than it is today. And, and uh, working hand in hand, week in and week out yeah. uh, in partnership, uh, staying on top of things, sharing supplies, sharing testing, com coming up with strategies to help not just our campus, but the entire community. Uh, really showed that also we could bring 20,000 people into a community and figure out how to do it, do it pretty safely. From what you're hearing across the country though, are other universities doing what you're doing? Like what Dr. Seitz said, working as a community, not as an entity, but as these are our community members that just happen to go to school here, what are you hearing across the country? I think it's a real mixed bag, to be yeah. honest. I, th I think some have done very well as, as we have in partnership and some there's been a lot of clash there of decision making of, of university thinking we need to do one thing for safety in a community thinking something else or doing something else. Mm -hmm. And so that's really hard when, when we have our faculty, our staff, our students flowing in and out of campus and community if the rules are different when you cross that that street that gets really hard to enforce it gets really hard to build a culture of compliance around these things and we well, were very fortunate in not having to figure that piece out but part of it is that it's all about how you partner and so if you think about um, the other group that's worked great hand in hand with all of us has been Lawrence Memorial because Dr. Jim Scrumsher, who is an infectious disease physician there, the deputy uh, public health officer for the county, and Dr. Tara Mar Marcelino, who is the uh, public health officer for the county of family medicine, Dr. L. L. Mage, they've been on our uh, medical advisory team, and they've done really great work in helping keeping all the points connected because LMH has been a pivotal part of this as well. And what I think this is what happens when a community and a university, the local hospital, the county all work together. You can master it. There's a lesson in there for all of us, right? There is a lesson for all of us. And they've been able to keep a community safe with, as you've said, 20,000 people immigrating into the, into the county all the time, right? They come, they go, they come, they go. And like that, that's the recipe for disaster, especially with the young kids tend to transmit the disease, tend to get together a lot. It's a pretty remarkable achievement. And you see that in other schools where they've had to shut down or had to do different things, the community's been at odds. We've not seen that in Lawrence. It's been great. And what they realize is they're all in together. And then business-wise, they all do better mm -hmm. because the county can stay open. So at the end of the day, And I would say great. the business community has been a very big partner in that as well. I mean, they've had to try and figure out how to continue to operate. And, and uh, uh, I will tell you, now having traveled to multiple other communities, I don't think there's a better outdoor dining scene than in Lawrence, <laughs> Kansas. I mean, they really have figured out how yeah. to not only stay in business, but expand their capacity and, right. and really create a culture it, it around may, it. They may want to keep it. <laughs> they they do want to keep it. People. They do want to keep it. <laughs> it's okay. been great. I want to take a little trip down memory lane with you because I don't think there's a person out there who can really not connect the beginning of this pandemic and when we knew this was a real problem 
people and then when it affected our sports life and we saw things shut down. And so I want to talk about uh, what you remember from that time, uh, March of 2020 and yep. and beyond and how it's affected and how it's evolved. And, and then I want to talk about your latest ultimatum to your sure. students. <laughs> You know, um, <laughs> yeah, Dr. Ultimatum. <laughs> uh, well, you know, going back to March, obviously, we were all sitting here in Kansas City uh, getting ready to kick off the Big 12 tournament, yeah, I remember uh, those which, days. which was also spring break for us, and which was important because that meant our students were not on campus. And as this was really starting to evolve very quickly, you know, the first decision was not to have fans at the Big 12 tournament, which evolved very quickly into just shutting down the tournament, mm -hmm. which evolved very quickly into just shutting down the entire March Madness. Um, which affected the best team in the country in college basketball. Ranked number one in all it. three polls. Yeah, and just we're going to finish the year and win the national championship. Just saying. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> just saying. Yeah. Just got to get that in there. Uh, they're really yeah, frustrating true. and disappointing yeah. for the guys. They worked yeah. so, so hard to get there. Uh, and our ladies team as well. They shut down the ladies' Big 12 tournament. But... Um, you know, but we really made the decision that that was when we were going to go online until we could kind of figure out our way through this and really spent the summer trying to plan for fall. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, and through that time, of course, we all had to scramble to get some supplies and some, <laughs> a few other things. Uh, obviously did not have vaccinations available at that point in time and, and uh, had to really work on building up our testing infrastructure uh, in great partnership with the health system to help make that happen. And a local business CRL was a terrific partner in that. Um, but we really learned then how to, to manage bringing back 20,000 people and then manage through the course of that semester. And, and uh, we were about 50% online, 50% in person, and, and uh, got through that year pretty well. Going into athletics, we figured out with the Big 12 what our testing protocols were going to be. Um, had some cancellations here and there mm -hmm. as, as we went through that, uh, but really figured out how to keep our athletes healthy and on, on the field or on the court. Um, and they were good sports. I mean, it, by the end of that year, I think I asked one of the, the football players, he said he'd been tested 170 times through the course <laughs> of, the, of the season. And that's just what it took at, at that point for us to feel comfortable putting everybody out on the Is field. It, were the trainers doing a lot of the testing? I mean, oh, what, yeah. I mean, the trainers that? had to take on a whole new set of responsibilities, right. right, of tracking it, of tracking the isolation, of conducting the testing, and maintaining the databases on that, doing that with other teams as they're coming onto your campus, and for 16 sports. Right. That wasn't in the job description. No, no. Mm -hmm. So um, they did a remarkable job of stepping up and, and, and really organizing all that. And and, and uh, we, our fondest saying back then was, uh, you know, there were lots of questions and, and the answer was always, we'll know more in two weeks. Yep. <laughs> we're building the airplane while we fly it. I remember the first airplane did this. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. I like those pictures from Kitty Hawk. Yeah. 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 yeah we were doing a little yeah. bump and run in there, but, but uh um, so we learned a lot through that and then coming, you know, then of course once the vaccinations became available, we're really pushing to get as many of our student athletes vaccinated as possible and I, I don't know, we're probably at excess in 98% I think at this I point. So. And then figuring out the st testing strategies for those who, who were not vaccinated. Um, and that really worked well through the fall until we hit this latest Omicron. variant, right? Yep. When, mm -hmm. when it became clear that, that mm -hmm. um, uh, it was much more infectious and, um, and certainly those that are vaccinated could still fall ill. And so uh, fortunately, not terribly. Not but, terribly, but, don't. But don't nonetheless, it, we had to kind of rethink once again. And, and uh, coming in uh, through uh, really wrapping up last semester, we, we ended on a pretty good note thinking we might be out of the woods, right? Until this latest surge. And, and that kind of happened over our break. And so we, we I, started again at a very different place than yeah. where we finished uh, that semester. And, and we had gone to uh, mass recommended in the field house mm -hmm. as things had settled down to almost nothing after Delta, right? And we thought we might have been out of the woods at that point. Well, there was a point, remember, we got down to five inpatients. That was yeah. really low. And just to say, I never forget, Amanda Gardner, who was on our program frequently and one of our, our great folks works here, had gone around and had worked with different groups at KU. And I just remember the pictures she sent from the orchestra. <laughs> when yes. They were all spread out. They had caps on their instruments. And I was like, I wonder how that sounds. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we just didn't know what we didn't know. Yeah, and and right. you're trying to keep everybody safe. And we, and, and let's be honest, the first few vi versions of this virus were a lot worse than, right. than, than yeah. in many ways than Omicron as far as the, the amount of, of disease it could or the disease burden if you got it. And so um, I think you're right. It, it, this is the perfect story of what happens in a community that really, Lawrence, is probably the camp's probably over 90 percent vaccinated and um, people masking and taking care of each other. Things work. 
businesses are open, they thrive, the, this community thrives, I mean, people work together. I mean, it's just like, this is how it should be everywhere. And I do think, and, and granted we're very good friends, but I just say Dr. Gerard has done a fantastic job leading the campus through their biggest crisis, right? The world's biggest crisis. Because not everybody had that outcome. Not everybody had that community. And so, you know, ultimately that's about leadership and people working with a spirit of cooperation is, is a, and, and remembering that the viruses are the enemy and not each other. And in places where you can remember that and work toward the same goal, you can have great success. And I think that's what LMH and that's what the, the, the county, the city, and the university have all experienced. Well, and that said, we came back this semester and we started seeing those numbers spike. They spiked. They just did as they yeah. did in, in all of our communities. And, and certainly Lawrence was not immune to that. And, and, um, and to, to levels that we had not seen in this pandemic. Um, and as we know, the, fortunately, the hospitalization, hospitalization rate per capita was less, Lower. but there were so many more cases that yeah. LMH started to struggle, mm -hmm. and as I know we were, did here. We were full. We got and about 214 pa 224 mm -hmm. patients here. Compounded <laughs> by the fact that a big chunk of your workforce is out ill. Yes. Um, and so uh, we, we did reach a point where, where um, we were really, really concerned, as we always have been through this, about overwhelming our health care systems. That was, that's really the ultimate challenge in this situation is, is can we take care of those people that are sick? Sick of everything, not not just um, mm -hmm. just right. not just the virus, but mm -hmm. heart attacks and yeah. and everything else. And so, um, trying not to overwhelm our teams. And so, um, that's when we we had to kind of batten it down again a little bit, you know, particularly in the athletics realm of saying we we really working with the county again. And the county went back to a mass mandate, which they had lifted, so they they put that back in place, mm -hmm. recognizing the same challenges. We went with them uh, through that into our athletics and and um, and they, for better or worse, we frankly are the only venue in the Big Twelve that has done this successfully. Well, and you gave and it ultimatum really to successful. students, right? I mean, you you said no, it wasn't the students. It was well, anyone all coming of us, to anybody yeah. coming. Yeah. If you come here, we're going to shut down concessions. We're going to limit the amount of people who can come into Allen Fieldhouse if you don't follow the county mandate. Correct. Right. Right. And, and recognizing that on any given game day in the field house, it's probably 80% non-Lawrence people. Right. So they're coming from everywhere else in the state and everywhere else in the state that maybe wasn't doing this. Mm -hmm. Right. So they were entering into a, a, a restricted environment that they were not experiencing anywhere else in their life, actually, at that point in time. So what's the feedback then? Um, and it was pretty good so I people mean, would rather watch ku basketball than they, they come. wearing a mask they come you know and we had a uh, kentucky game we were full to the rafters everybody was incredibly compliant i think we uh we might have had one ejection for issues around a mask not an ejection somebody left voluntarily and but and, everyone was masked. Uh, but exactly. everybody was masked and and uh which was great and it was great for us to demonstrate that that was espn game day Second most watched ESPN game day in history. Yes. Two point two million viewers to That's that amazing. game. I wish we'd won it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, not our best. But I want to see the team that beat down some of these other teams play go play Kentucky again. But that was a good way to be on the national spotlight. It was. I like that. Well, and, and when you do see them on national TV and you see everybody following the mandate and it's still loud and you're like, these folks are still having a good time. And I mean, they're again, cool. Yeah. It's just a great example of how you can control this and and, and not let it ruin your life. Right. You can still go out and right. do good things and and that's and then watch the basketball team win. All right, I'm going to peruse some questions that are coming in sure. from our community. I'm going to let you ask a couple of questions to Dr. Gerard. You guys visit a little bit. I'm going to just ask a couple You're of questions. You're going to go through there. a couple of things. Okay, so I, I, yeah, as so you, go look, you look back on the whole pandemic thing, what has been the hardest moment that you've faced? You know, I think uh, probably those early days, right, mm -hmm. when we shut it we down with uh, not having the resources we knew we needed at that particular moment of time and the nic resources everything from ability to test uh, ppe um, financial not knowing the implication of that mm -hmm. how you're going to keep the lights on and and knowing that it's a lot easier to shut down than it is to open up mm -hmm. and and so I, th I think that was probably the hardest time for everybody there's just so much uncertainty in the world not just on campus at so, that juncture so there are a lot of doctors who are chancellors or presidents of universities, but there are very few medical doctors. Has that given you more insight? You know, I think it's it's known who to lean on to put together, for example, our pandemic medical advisory team and just pulling the best resources available in our community to help advise us through that process. Those relationships, I think, were extraordinarily helpful for us and, and for our campus to to 
uh, have some confidence in the decisions that were being made, uh, that were being made for the right reasons with the best knowledge available at that moment right. in time. Uh, exactly. Uh, and that that evolved constantly. Yeah. And, and so uh, I, I think he gave us an advantage there. I, did, I was on a panel with four, uh, there were four of us in the AAU, the research universities that have physicians at the helm. And I, th mm -hmm. I think to the person we all agreed, it probably didn't give us any more credibility. <laughs> <laughs> How can that not be? Okay, so here's the other thing. So, you know, a campus is known for their open um, uh, communication and just for the open debate and discussion, because that's what, you know, college campuses are like. How do you think the faculty received all these mandates, et cetera? How did, how did they respond and, and the students? Because those are two very different camps. Yeah, but I think both are just cross-sections of our society and, and, and represent every element of our society in terms of those who were not particularly concerned about going into this to those who were overly concerned about going into this. And, 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 and we, we experienced every one of those emotions uh, through the process. Yeah. And, you know, one end you got frustration because they're not sure we need to be doing all this stuff. And the other end, great extreme concern that something terrible is going to happen. And that's a lot of anxiety and frustration to deal with uh, on a campus and in a community and uh, I would say all in all we've all developed a lot of resilience through this and and uh, we've done a lot of that as a community and you know somewhere embedded in there was a learning experience for these students that someday they'll kind of fall back on and say you know <laughs> I actually I learned there. something <laughs> I was there that's actually a pretty big deal uh, I've got do you have to go early I, I do check and see early. if your I'm patients gonna, I'm here gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna check right now Okay, and then I'm going to ask Dr. Gerard. We have Isaac has a question. How many students have dropped out because of the uh, the current surge? Have we ha is dropping out been an issue? Current surge, I would say no. Okay. I mean, I, mean, I think uh, again, I think we all learned how to adjust last mm -hmm. year um, to this when when we uh, not only shut down but then tried and then started open back up again and have learned how to flex a little bit. We've we've tried to create that flexibility in, although we're we're. 80 plus percent in person and that's the intent and the design because we still believe that's a way to, to educate uh, but I don't believe this semester we've seen a lot of that last year we saw a significant reduction all right but uh, we really rebounded that this year and, and uh, it's been going well all right Isaac is a Mizzou guy but he has a question for our KU guy due to online learning are traditional snow days a thing of the past at KU I read that they are at Mizzou is that something people even consider now? Yeah, you know, we've had some snow. We've had a couple snow days here this year, and we had a lot of debate over that, and, and we still have snow days. And, and the challenge is not everybody can flex. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you say those who can flex, flex, and the rest you're just out of luck, that really creates, creates oh. an uneven playing field for because uh, not every student has the ability to, to have the technology at home or where their environment is. We certainly learned that the last year, uh, and not every faculty member has to be able to do that. And by the way, if you happen to have little kids, it's really hard to run your class from home when they have a snow day. So, so it, it's a mess. It, it, it really is kind of a mess, and we debated on that. But we really decided uh, at this joint, at this juncture, at least, we we still have snow days. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and it is kind of a party day, right? I mean, it is still. There's something that could be fun. It is fun. Well, sure. I mean, you to actually call snow, it a right? snow day is fun. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Gene has a question. Does the university provide housing for those folks who are in isolation? So last year we, we actually leased out a, a private dorm and used that as our isolation uh, facility, and that was very, very helpful. I think we probably had as many as 150, 170 students in there at any, any point in time, and the dining folks had to figure out how to deliver food and do all, do all of that. Um, this year we have some of that capacity but we also are doing more isolating in place as well um, if people have the ability to do that at home we know how to do it now and, and um, so it's a mixture this year we've yeah. learned we have we have you know stay let's, home when you're sick that's yeah. that's let's the thing help. we've learned right Dana? Don, stay Don, home when right. you're sick <laughs> Don <laughs> needs some help our school district chose to make masking optional effective immediately can you give us some insight as to how to protect our children well they um, i've always told my kids to wear a mask to protect other people uh, just having some fears today about that and she may have younger kids but maybe you can give us some insight into your thoughts about um, the big kids versus the little kids and just how to kind of muddle through that sure well I think so first of all uh, optional means you got to make your own choices in life right and and so um, 
Um, you still can wear your mask, and if you're uncomfortable, you should wear your mask. And if you're in an indoor crowded environment right now, at least while the numbers are they're still coming down, they're not down yet, but they're still coming down, um, I, I think we would all agree that's absolutely the right thing to do, even if those around you are not. Yeah, um, I think I, it's, still, it's yeah. still the right thing to do, and the numbers are still high. And so I, I'm not surprised that school districts are shifting to more of an optional policy because mm -hmm. they, they struggle having to put it on. There's just so much political discourse around it. Um, but I think Hawkeye, yeah. that even though that's true, there's still a fairly high rate of community transmission. It is a f you got to work with your kids to make that sort of informed mm -hmm. choice. Yeah. And then I think each school district is just going bit by bit to do it. And I think what we'll probably see, because the overall numbers are dropping, I think they'll continue to drop. I think that as masks come off in schools, the decline's probably going to flatten out a little. Yeah, you know, I, I would agree with all of that. I think you're exactly right. Um, I don't remember the reference right off the top of my head, but there is good data to support the fact that even people who are wearing masks around people who don't wear masks uh, can be protected. Now, that protection improves and increases if you are vaccinated. Um, so I think it's important to be fully vaccinated. Stay up to date uh, with your vaccination, meaning get that booster. Um, just was reading, I think, a couple articles today in the Washington Post about, uh, or in the Kansas City Star, one of the two, about uh, a young nine-month-old yeah, uh, just... girl who, who died I... of COVID-19. Obviously, nine months old can't get vaccination, but people around them can get it and help protect. Also, another uh, seven-year-old girl had died recently. So it does affect the younger populations uh, at less predominance than the older populations, but it still serves to uh, to let people know and understand really we need to protect everybody and staying up to date with those vaccinations is going to do that. In addition, if you feel uncomfortable in those situations, wear a mask as well. Dr. Seitz, I know you need to get to your patient, so I'm going to let you have a final thought. Okay, here we go. So I, I think that there is um, there's a saying that goes along with how well we've performed with KU, with Dr. Gerard and the whole campus and the community. And I think there are to be congratulated. So I think that what you say is, because they've done it the right way, is you say, rock chalk Jayhawk. Isn't there that the right go. to do it? And, and for right. a Mizzou Tiger to say that, that's a pretty <laughs> big is, statement. It's a big statement. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I probably wear my Jayhawk right there on the lapel. Yeah, and and uh, because I do think it is important for us all to see what happens when we come together and work together as a team, just as you can win football games, basketball games, whatever else the sport may be, you can win at, at COVID too. And, and, and not every game, not every moment is a win, but overall, when you've kept a community safe, a campus safe, and people have not just gotten through it, but they've actually, they've kind of thrived, then I think you have to step back and say, wow, that's what happens when people really work together. Honest conversations, great planning, the rules of infection control, and suddenly things work out. And I think this is going to be a great chapter in the history of KU. And I think Dr. Gerard should get a lot of credit. He won't give himself credit for it, but I will. But you will. All right, go get to work. And <laughs> we'll, right. we'll have Dr. Gerard questions. back on soon. And, All right. you know, I'll, I'll uh, you know, echo with that, with the subcontext of this large population at the university, younger people, we know they are going to want to congregate and get together and, and gather. And w that is also in the context of other well-known universities or larger universities that we see had to shut down and do that to keep their students and faculty safe. So I would just echo what Dr. Stite said in the context of, of those two very important points. Yeah. All right, Dr. Gerard, I have a couple more questions for you before we let you go. Um, question about the numbers at Lawrence Memorial since the current surge began. Do we know what that looks like maybe compared to last year or even here locally? Well, certainly in, in Lawrence, uh, we experienced what you experienced here in the Kansas City Metro, which was we saw the highest number of inpatients in, through, at any time during the pandemic. We really saw that in the last six or eight weeks. Uh, we saw that peak. We saw that really stretch the health system, the uh, Lawrence Memorial, because they also had staff out, which made it difficult to staff beds. Uh, and it was kind of an all hands on deck, much as it was here, yeah. that, that uh, people just pitched in to get through it. Um, and, and, and now we are on the other side of that peak, and we are starting to see numbers drop. They are still, I believe, even today, higher than they were at our peak during the Delta surge. Really? And so um, I think we're about to cross that threshold, but, but mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think we may have a slide here somewhere of, of, of what the numbers look like in, in uh, Lawrence and Douglas County, but those, and those numbers are dropping. Um, there you go, you've got that, perfect. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys, well done. Um, but you can see that number's just now getting down to our peak 
that was that occurred previously. So, so that peak there in January, I'm looking at right yeah, in 2022, yeah. and then that steep drop off. The steep drop off, but you, the drop off is still above the peaks of the yeah. rest of the curve, right? Yeah. So we're just now starting to get down to the worst that we saw at any other time. Wow. And so, um, and we know that hospitalizations lag that, and we know unfortunately the deaths lag that, mm-hmm. and so we probably haven't seen the worst yet of where we're starting to see the drop in hospitalization. So hopefully we are past that piece of it. And in in uh, Dr. Hawkinson, I think that's what we're seeing here as well yeah. in the health system. No, you're exactly right. You know, uh, same exact things, just on different proportions with different. Uh, different numbers because of the size of the health system compared to Lawrence Morrill. But I, I think your point also about the staff that were out, that le- led to serious capacity issues because of the amount of ill patients, but also the amount of staff that were out um, because they couldn't care for them. So I think that was a great point as well. Yeah. All right, Mary has a question for you, Dr. Gerard. Uh, based on the broadband lessons learned during the remote learning days, is KU working with the Lawrence School District and Haskell to develop a plan to expand broadband coverage in the community? How are you working with them? Well, I think that's, uh, we've known we've had a broadband issue in our state for many years, quite honestly, and KU has been a leader in telehealth across the country, but but we've we've known that the broadband is a problem, it really creates challenges even with telehealth as you get out across our state. And and what we learned and, and working with our colleagues at Haskell learned as well um, is when kids went home, they did not necessarily have access yeah. to reasonable internet. And so mm-hmm. you really can't do remote yeah. learning if yeah. you can't plug in. We had students on, on Indian reservations that were driving 30 miles to the gas station just to be able to connect. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and, and we know that is true of other students as well. So we, we developed a lot of hot spots. We got a lot of hot spots that so we were able to send people home and that helped boost their signal wherever they were. Uh, but we know in the state of Kansas, we have a major challenge with that. So working with, with the governor and the SPARC committee and, and the legislature, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that some of the federal money that they, they still have to apply will be put into this broadband challenge. Thanks for the update on that. Uh, Dr. Hawkinson, I'm just going to give the last question to you from Terry. If I had tight chest, uh, chest tightness mm-hmm. and soreness after my last COVID shot mm-hmm. for three days, any mm-hmm. recommendation for the booster? Should there be any concern? Go ahead and get it. You know, again, I think this delves into individual health, and I would really speak with your medical provider. Um, chest tightness, those types of symptoms can be uh, because of a variety of different things. Obviously, the most important, we are going to be concerned about, you know, cardiac disease, um, heart attack, things like that. So I think it's important to discuss those types of issues with your medical provider who knows your medical history, who can do an exam, who can ask you questions, uh, need be, they can look and see if you're still having symptoms. So I I think it is important, number one, I think it is very important you get that booster dose, uh, but also in the context of the symptoms you had, it's very important to talk with your provider, your physician, and really evaluate to make sure it's not something else that needs to be uh, evaluated. Dr. Gerard, thank you so much for being with us today. We're so glad you were here. You'll have to come back and see us soon. Mm -hmm. Um, In the meantime, uh, can we get some final thoughts from you? Sure. Well, I, I would just, uh, first of all, thank the health system for the assistance that we've gotten through the course of this pandemic. Everything from running a swab clinic on our, our campus for the better part of a year to uh, helping with advice and backup to our teams uh, in, in Lawrence. And uh, it's really just been a wonderful collaborative effort. I, I hope we're about to see, see our way through this in the next handful of weeks. And, and, uh, and yet, I know that we're going to have to stay diligent, and, and those collaborations will be fruitful for us all for the years to come and we'll stand ready for whatever the next challenge is. Thank you so much for your updates today yeah. and your message. Dr. Hawkins and your final thoughts. Yeah, you know, we know that uh, strong leadership and those principles, they all trickle down. Uh, we have seen this, I, I've witnessed firsthand here at the health system with Bob Page and Tammy Peterman, just understanding from the start of the pandemic, what have we heard Dr. Seitz, Dr. Gerard mention about the Big 12 uh, shutting down you know, way back at the beginning of the pandemic. We have seen the same thing in Lawrence with Dr. Durad, working with Lawrence Memorial Hospital, working with the county to really keep things safe. You know, also it's trickled down to the athletics, working with Brian Conway and Dr. McGee and really trying to keep all those athletes, all of those students safe, the whole community safe. So I think it remains uh, important to, to identify that and, and see that people are doing conscious things and that really all of these strong values and principles do trickle down. We have great leadership here Uh, in the state of Kansas, and we just need to keep using the data, the science, helping to inform our decisions, and really keeping everybody safe. 
Thank you both so much. And thank you all for being with us today. We do want to remind you again about an exciting new weekly program that starts this Thursday morning. It is called All Things Heart and it is hosted by Alexis Del Cid. She is going to dive in and explore how everything in life from nutrition, emotions, lifestyle, environment, genetics, how it all leads back to your heart. You'll meet some amazing patients and doctors along the way. That is right here this Thursday and every Thursday at 10 a.m. Tomorrow, COVID denial is still a thing. It is still very real. We're gonna take a look at why smaller communities are still trailing bigger cities when it comes to fighting COVID. Everyone, please have a great Tuesday and we will see you back here tomorrow at eight. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.